everybody we're getting ready to get started and um, just a reminder that we're recording this meeting um, so that's buttons already been selected so if you share anything that'll be on the recording there um, and we'll be opening up for questions soon but we're gonna start with a little update from Barbara hi everybody Thanks for joining today. Good to see your smiling faces. Um, wow, what a great video that was. I don't know if you had a chance to see that yet or not. Uh, uh, Heather uh, Barger put that together and all the staff sent pictures. So uh, it's hard to believe we've only been in school for five days, but it is true. And uh, it just seems like old times here, kind of, with a few twists. Um, but anyway, very cool. Thank you, Heather, and all the staff for um, sharing that information. It was really terrific. Let me mute my phone. Um, so let's see. Um, anyway, just want to start with thank yous and gratitude. Uh, I think we have the most patient and partner-oriented group of families on the planet, and we are so um, happy to share this beginning the start of the school with each of you because uh, you you make it so easy um, and uh, we are I don't know I just can't say that enough I have colleagues all over the state that feel differently and um, I'm very grateful and I know we can all say that as well um, we want you to know unlike other schools and businesses locally that we are fully staffed and have been um, since the beginning of the year um, so that's all really great um, we have just a fantastic group of humans. I am, we even uh, have a new alumni, um, a graduating class that's here as a teacher this year. So anyway, we are 
um, really enjoying getting to know our new coworkers as well as our um, coworkers and some of them have been here as, as much as 17, 18 years that um, we are very fortunate for them. And uh, wow, it is, it is uh, good to see the building full with all these humans again and not being off campus. Um, we do, however, still need subs, and on April, on, on April, my goodness, September 7th, we have the sub volunteer, it's just a sub workshop this year for families, and, um, you know, I'll say this maybe once or twice during this call, that uh, we're trying to keep the building open with all the kids all year, and in order to do that, we need to have lots of ways of support. We don't utilize programs like Kelly Services and things for subs because we have such a unique learning environment. And who can help us best is our parents to come in and assist in the studios with another one of the co-teachers um, when someone needs to be out because they have potential symptoms or need to care for a, a, a child at their house. And so please, if you're available and able, um, we would love to see about you being a potential sub at our school. So September 7th, mark your calendar. It'll be virtual, yes. Um, and then, uh, Caroline, I just want to say thanks again for all your patience and help with that. Gosh, um, by Friday, we had the, this, the um, different levels completing Caroline within the allotted time frame. I can't believe it. And that was mostly due to each of you for showing up um, for at your allotted time frame so that we didn't have an overlap. Um, that's where the problem started struggle because when we have people showing up early then they get in the wrong car line and it just slows the process up so thank you thank you for timing that or taking those spin around the block of one of our neighborhoods around here um, we really appreciate that um if you're not getting the emails like cupola notes which usually come out on monday um and the studio emails which usually come out on friday um, please make sure you email uh, Prana so we can check your um, your email addresses. Prana, if you could just drop your email address in the chat. If anyone is struggling getting any of those emails, we made those changes last week with uh, like the 9 to 12. Thanks, Prana. Um, with the 9 to 12, um, Carline moving it up front, and that's worked really well. And so, but we still have some families going, what? I thought they brought, you know. Blended families are families that only come pick up ever so often because they're sharing carpooling and such. Um, so anyway, yes, thank you for that. Um, and I uh, just want to say thanks for, gosh, I, I followed this little young person in to school the other day. They were late for the early ed car line and uh, they didn't have their mask and that happens a lot. So thank you each for reminding your learner before they get out of their car to put their mask on. But this little one got out of the car, their family was running late. They were in the six to nine car line or nine to 12 car line and they were a three to six kiddo. And so I walked in with them and I said, you, let, let's put your mask on. They were like, oh no, I forgot my mask. And then they go, wait a minute, I have a spare in my bag. And he was four. And it was the most adorable thing I've witnessed all since the beginning of the year to watch this little one go into his bag where the family had packed in this nice baggie, an extra mask and an extra lanyard and supported him in putting that on and joining his studio. So thank you, thank you. Uh, we are so appreciative of that. Um, good news is we have about 580 learners on campus today, which is awesome. Um, and uh, we do have um, people out because of potential symptoms and things. <clears throat> Just today alone, um, we have about 20 learners that we've added to our what we call our tracking sheet. So anytime there's a child that goes home because of symptoms or siblings because someone has symptoms or you call in and are keeping them home, like just today, we've added 20 children and teens to that list. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that today. Um, some of those, about I think about nine of those have gone home already today. We just um, are sending a learner home um, shortly um, that came to their teacher at lunchtime and said, I can't taste or smell anything. So those things are happening. Um, we have only had one positive case in the school, like a person that has been positive and has been in the building, but we have had at least a dozen, maybe 20 now of family members that have been positive or someone else in the household that's been positive. It's just that the learner, like that happened before they came on campus, except for that one situation. So um, it was in the nine to 12 program. Um, we still have tests that are out. And so I'm gonna give an update. Um, Melissa Wiesinger and I are, and Paige are on the um, 
Indiana Department of Health weekly webinar with the Nurses Association. So I'm going to kind of share with you some of that, seeing a big change in their communication over the last couple of weeks. And so I, I'm sure most of you are well aware and conscious, but I'd like to just take this time for us to share. And I'll ask Melissa to jump in if I miss anything, um, because it's a lot of information, but we'll kind of go over some of that and talk about what does that mean for us? What, what do we all need to be aware of and conscious of? Again, goal is keep learners in the building and um, keep the school open. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so, uh, Friday, um, the U.S., the United States saw 176,000 positive co uh, cases. I don't know if you're aware of that, so that was a really big jump. Um, on a seven-day average, there are about 150,000 cases. A, a few, like a month ago, that was like under 10,000, and so it's up to, um, it was 176,000 on Friday. Um, the moving average is 150,000 in Indiana. On July 11th, we had 152 cases in the whole state of Indiana. On August 11th, we had 3,100 cases in Indiana. So just showing things are, have shifted, things are changed. Um, the moving average for Indiana is about 2,100 cases a day. Um, currently, children are currently 20% of all the positive cases, which is also a big increase. Um, we have an 84% increase of COVID for children and teens, um, and hospitalizations are as high as they were in February right now in the nation, in Indiana as well. Um, Delta, um, so I'm gonna have uh, Melissa show a slide here, is currently 95, well, we could see that again because we love that. Um, it was 95% uh, of the cases right now are the Delta variant, so you can kind of see from this dark orange is the Delta variant. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's taking the majority. They also talked about what's called Delta Plus. And from my understanding, Delta Plus is not another variant, but it's just saying that there already is a new sequencing happening with the Delta variant, which will probably lead to additional variants. And Indiana Department of Health, the nurses that were on the call and the, the state health um, director was just sharing that, um, that vaccination is the only real way to change what's happening. Um, right now we have about 50% of our population in Indiana that's vaccinated. Um, and, excuse me, in addition to that, masks are the, are the next best thing we can do. Um, but, you know, the Delta variant, what we know will happen is with more transmission, there will be more variants. And with more variants, there will be more breakthrough cases. Breakthrough cases are when people that are fully vaccinated end up with COVID. And I'm sure most of you on the call know people at this point that have been fully vaccinated and end up with COVID, um, even though there's a very small percentage that have been hospitalized. Um, that percentage that's being shared is still like at 1%. Um, uh, but what we do know is that the more transmission, the more variants, et cetera. So sharing what the Indiana Department of Health shared with that. And then um, Delta is more contagious. So uh, Melissa, you can go ahead and pull that slide up. Um, this was a, a slide that they shared at the webinar. Um, it just takes a minute to kind of take that in, um, that it's more contagious than all of those things, including seasonal flu and the common cold, and it's more deadly than all of those on the slide there, measles, um, the original COVID strain, flu, chicken pox, common cold, um, so those are just the um, statistics of where we are right now with Delta. And hospitalizations compared to seasonal flu, that's been something some of us uh, families have talked about, like, is it more contagious? Um, I have not got this confirmed, but, um, I, you know, I'm hearing that people have gone to the doctor and have been diagnosed with a strand of the flu. We're not really testing yet for the flu, but that it appears that some doctor's offices are saying that. But go ahead and show the next slide, Melissa. <clears throat> so this is um, the new admissions. So this is per 100,000 of population. And it just shows that, you know, that this, that children, uh, zero to 17 year olds are, you know, headed off the chart as far as hospitalizations right now. So this is in um, Indiana. Uh, this is in the United States. In Indiana, the, 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 uh, is, it's going almost exactly the same. And it's peaking about two weeks after 
Um, you know, so where, wherever the infection rate is in the community, the children hospitalizations are peaking about two weeks after that. Um, and I know some of you have asked about multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So that's that M, I, S, and dash C means for the children. <clears throat> so I'm going to drop um, the symptoms in there. It is still very rare. There's only like 440, um, 4,400 cases. Um, in the United States right now, in Indiana, there's between 100 and um, 150 of those. Uh, I cannot drop it in there for whatever reason. Maybe it's because the chat is closed. I'm not sure. I'll try that. In, oh, it's not available. So I'll drop that in when, when we open the chat up in a minute. Um, but anyway, um, it, it is just something to be aware of. Parents have asked, you know, um, rash is a symptom of that. There is hand, foot, and mouth going around. Um, the rash that's associated um, with COVID just in general and with multi-system inflammatory system in children. Um, and so, you know, just to keep that um, in, in aware, again, very rare. Um, but one of the things I think the Indiana Department of Health really wanted us to know is that uh, there are... Um, where the original COVID, one person would infect one to two people. Now one person is infecting eight to nine people. And so um, it's just it's just that much more infectious. So we just need to, to keep our mind about it. Scott County, um, I think it's called Scott County One, um, which is an Austin area. Um, they weren't even in school for, for a week and they're quarantined the whole school until August 23rd. And so I know some of you have had known about that. Um, we're working really, really hard to keep our infection rate and transmission rate low so we can keep people on campus. But that is happening all throughout the state of Indiana um, that we are having schools, whole school systems closed down for periods of time. Um, we have about, uh, I, I think I shared, we've had about a dozen uh, parents or guardians positive. Um, and with these 20 families that are kiddos that we've tracked today, I just want to take this minute and to remind you, if anyone in the house has symptoms, everybody stays home. They don't come on campus. And I know that's tricky. I know it's allergy season. I know there's the common cold. And I know that it's a pain because your kid wants to be at school. <laughs> they don't want to miss out. They want to be a part of what's happening and all those things. And we want them to too, but we don't want the system to collapse. And if they come so that the, the, the 10 or so that we've sent home today, the 20 or so that you've communicated about today, um, if they come and they each infect eight to nine people, we're going to be in the same situation as Scott County and we'll have to close. So, um, you know, we're fortunate right now. Our families are so conservative about this and conscientious about it and keeping kids home. Like we had a family that said, oh, this person was, had, was close contact with this person. Even though they don't live in the household, we see them and we're going to keep everyone home and we're going to get everyone tested. And we thank you for that because we know it's a pain to go on and off. And we know it's really hard right now to get PCR tests. Um, in our community, and PCR test is the test we ask you to get, and we know that there are some of us that know what a PCR test is, and we still leave the doctor, and we're like, oh no, they gave us an antigen test, or some other test, and you're like, ah. um, and so it's not the end of the world, but it is, you know, it is the best way for us to know, like we have antigen tests here that we are giving kiddos that are symptomatic, that are going home, um, we have never had a positive in that situation. It's like 63% effective. It doesn't give us great peace of mind. So it is best to get the PCR test, but we know that it is hard. And, and some of you are used to going up by Sam's Club to the community center there, and that is no longer there. And so we were really encouraging and still encouraging to find a place that you test, go get tests so you know how it works. Some of you are using Walgreens. Some of you are using the 4-H Fairgrounds. I understand there's a pop-up um, COVID testing clinic in Jeff right now, and there will be more of those. Um, I know from talking to the, our local health commissioner, um, two things that he said that are really notable uh, recently. One is that he feels like we have the best plan to stay open through winter break. So that's something for us to all hold on to. Um, and he also said that we are working on making more ways to get PCR testing and more options in our community. 
In addition to that, we're working with a place called, Prana, you might need to help me with this, Midwest something. And Midwest Coordination Center. Thank you. Um, and they are providing PCR testing to schools. And so bless Prana's heart with all the other things we have going on. I'm like, can you help us do this? And so we've been working with this company. Um, unfortunately, when the contract was originally created in Indiana with this um, company, it was for pool testing. Anyway, long story short, it's probably going to be the 1st of September before we'll be able to do PCR testing on campus. But if you have given us permission to do so, it will send you a consent form. Eventually, we'll let you know more when we have that information. Um, and you will um, sign the consent form. It'll create a portal for you. Um, we will uh, we actually just give the young person, it's just five-year-olds and up right now, um, the swab. They swab themselves. We put it together. It's similar to what Walgreens does if, done if you've done theirs. Um, and so we can actually, you know, if you have a kiddo sick at home, eventually, not yet, um, you can stop by the school, we'll bring you out a packet, you'll bring it back to us, it'll go with the courier at two o'clock that afternoon, and hopefully in about a day, you'll get the results in your portal. So we know that you need that, and we are trying to help get that as soon as possible, because the quicker we all know, the less time we have people going on and off campus. So um, we really think that's an important uh, next step as well. Um, I know there's some questions. Let me get through the rest of this information, then we'll take those. Um, you know, we know there are different opinions about COVID. We know there are different opinions about masking, and we appreciate that people have put all that aside so that we can just be a school and just do the things that will keep us open. So we, we do thank you. I know there, there have been questions about uh, masks and you know sometimes we've sent your child home with one of our masks because their mask was not fitting. Um, and Kiddos will not be on campus if they cannot have their mask fit. If it goes underneath their nose, we're going to start sending them home. So we're gonna work as hard as we can to help you find the right mask and help them to get the right mask. And, oh, I don't know, 98, 99% of the kiddos on this campus are doing that. There's just a, a few and we need your help with that. You know, we need you to practice with them. Um, get different masks. If you need masks, we have masks. Kelly up at the Curved Desk has a whole slew of inventory of things that we can help you try different kinds um, that we have been given from the state and elsewhere. So if you need support, let us know and we will help you with that. <clears throat> but that's going to be really, really important moving forward. And we're going to continue to follow the things like the Indiana Department of Health, the CDC, our local um, health commissioner, and, you know, we've created a plan that will hopefully keep the teachers being a Montessori school. And so that is our goal. That's our intent. That's what we're doing. And we can do that if kids are in the building. Um, and we're working on contingency plans. If we need to go back off campus for a period of time, um, or we need us to impose a hybrid um, schedule. We are making contingency plans. We know how to do this. We've done it before. We'll be ready to pivot. No one wants to do it. So if we all keep doing our part, maybe we'll, we'll be one of the schools that never has to close or has to go to hybrid. So that's what our hope is and that's what our goal is. Um, as you know, we have a committee of staff that helps to create our plans. So there's about 21 staff members. We actually met last week. And we decided to make some changes in how we're doing uh, masking breaks. It's, it's the number one way that we can control because we can't control vaccines. We can encourage people to get vaccinated, but we can't control it. But what we can do is help to make sure everyone is masked appropriately. And so we can reduce the amount of spread. And so we, we will only be letting kids take breaks from masks when they're outside. Um, staff has also reduced any of our breaks so only, and really, I'm when I'm on, in my space all the time, we're just wearing our mask all the time at this point. I took, took it off today. I thought about just using it because to model that, we're all trying to just keep our masks on all day long now. Um, and so if you're in a video call with a staff member, if they can't be away from everybody else, you'll see their mask back on. And so we're just doing all the things because we know that vaccinated people can also spread COVID like unvaccinated people. So... Here's the piece that I also want you to remember. <clears throat> day zero of a quarantine is the last day of contact with the COVID positive person. Now I told you we've had a dozen or 20 different situations where we've had positive COVID in a household. And families will say, well, we're isolating. And maybe you are, and if you can do it, great. 
it is hard to do. <laughs> it is hard to do, especially if you have a young child um, or if you're sharing a bathroom or kitchen together. Like it means the last contact, masked or not. It means 15 minutes cumulative over a 24 hour period. So if my child um, is going to the school and I'm positive, the last time I had contact with them, the best thing to do is to see if they can go, if you have options, like to go to grandparents' house or something, um, then that will let them come back quicker. If not, it could be, you know, three and a half weeks before they come back because day zero is the last day of the close contact. So if that means that I'm positive, <clears throat> and then I am isolating, so I'm self-isolating for 10 days after I'm positive. So let's say that's on September 1st, that's the day zero, and the next day is day one of a 14-day quarantine, because somebody could not get the virus load until the last day of the person's isolation. Isolation means I'm positive, I'm isolating from others for a period of 10 days. Quarantine means I'm a close contact and I am quarantining from others. doesn't mean you have to quarantine from your household. Most of the time, your whole house is going to be quarantined. <laughs> so you, you have your child there. Take care of your child. It's all right. Um, but just um, know that, you know, you shouldn't be going out. I mean, CDC has different guidelines from that. They're saying if you go out and you're vaccinated, wear a mask. We're saying they're not coming on campus um, if, you know, if, if they have someone in their household that's positive. What does what it do, is helpful is if we have a teen that's been vaccinated at our school and they were a close contact in the school, they don't have to quarantine. At this point, that might change, but at this point, that's the benefit that they get here on our campus. But if someone in their household is positive, there's no break for any of us. We're all treated the same, vaccinated or not vaccinated. The other piece is uh, PCR testing. Um, just make sure that you ask for PCR testing. Um, some people are like, well, I think it's a, it's a, um, an, uh, what's it called? Not an instant PCR. It's a, help me, Melissa. Rapid. Rapid PCR. There really isn't, you know, most of the time a PCR test will take at least a day to get back. Now, some of the hospitals have like a 20 minute, um, a PCR um, but, you know, just ask around, ask your, you know, pediatrician. Sometimes pediatricians are letting you just come in for a PCR test. So find those places out because you will need it if you haven't already one time, one day or the other. Um, we, the, here's the other tricky part. So the staff, I mean, we have been so busy up here all morning with the 20 people that we put on the tracking list and doing rapid tests and calling families and isolating kids and sending them home. Like, it is a full-time job for the five of us up here. And we know once you've got your kid at home and you get the results, you want them to come back. <laughs> you got the results in your hand. You want them to come back tomorrow. I'm letting you know at 6 o'clock. Can you let me know if they can come back tomorrow? And we're saying... If you find out about your testing, your PCR test, after the school day, okay, if school gets out at 3 or 2.50, after the school day, just assume they'll stay home for one more day before you come back. I'm really encouraging teachers and staff to not feel like they have to be on call and communicating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I know that puts you at a disadvantage. I was doing emails last night between 12 and 1. My coworkers were making fun of me this morning because I was trying to prevent the teachers from feeling like they had to do something quickly, right? And so we're just asking, if you get it back, just say, here's the results. I know we're staying home tomorrow, but once you're, you and your team have looked at it, um, if you've seen as many PCR tests as we do, it, they are confusing. Sometimes it takes you three minutes to find where it's a PCR test. You know, like you're looking through, it's like three pages long. We're asking the teachers, they don't have to do all that. They send it to the COVID team. There's a group of six of us that are part of the COVID team. One of us takes it. We review it. We say, yes, it's acceptable. Um, but I will tell you, maybe 40% of the time, it's not a PCR test. And so then we have to tell the family, I'm so sorry. We had a family that tested three times this weekend <laughs> um, trying to get a PCR test. And it is, it is frustrating when that happens. And then we say, please wait till Tuesday to come back. And I know that is not what we want to hear, but I'm telling you that I'm protecting them so that they can do their job. And if we can all work together on that, that just makes that all the better for all of this. So 
If you get the results of a, of a PCR test, you know, it's one of the three things. If your kiddo has symptoms that are COVID and that we could talk about for hours. Um, we do have kids that have a slight runny nose and this is allergy season for them. And we have, we've seen that this has happened every year for them that are still coming in the building if that's all that's going on. Or, you know, it, there, there's different reasons that maybe we make an exception. Um, but in most cases, if anyone has symptoms, everyone stays home. And then you do one of the three things. You either stay home for 14 days, you do a PCR test, or you get a note from the doctor that says non-COVID related. I will tell you from experience, we've had very few doctors that have written that note. Most of the time they'll say, we think it's something else. Well, they don't know. Unless they say non-COVID related, the doctor's note will not help us, right? So then you end up getting a PCR test. And then you get the PCR test, you get it back on two o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday and you really want your child to start on Monday. But instead, you're gonna say to the teacher, here it is, they're gonna stay home Monday so that you guys can let us know that everything's good for them to come back. And we'll keep doing an absence waiver, we'll keep working on the asynchronous work on the Google Classroom, and we'll email you with any questions, right? And that's what's gonna keep us all working together. We also have, devices that we're working on to go back home um, when you have to quarantine or your child is ill. So um, if you have um, a kiddo in that situation right now and need help, talk to the teacher. They'll work with Glenn. We'll get you a device so that you can work from home. So we will have a more consistent process for that sooner than later. But for right now, if you need it, just reach out to your teachers. Let them know. They'll contact Glenn and we'll get it taken care of for you. Same thing with hybrid. I, I hope that's not going to happen, but we are putting a contingency plans in place for that as well. Okay. I know I just talked for 28 minutes and I am sorry. I know some of you have questions. Um, I'm going to have Melissa go ahead and open up the chat. I'm going to drop this link in here. So if you want to learn more about that multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome for children, you can look up those specific um, details. All right. So questions. We did have a hand up, but I think it went down. <clears throat> the person is still here who has their question. It was me, Melissa. Okay. And I feel like it was covered, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyways, just because I had it up for so long. But essentially, it's talking about the need to quarantine. So, of course, um, for those with allergies and things like that, we take them to the immediate care center. They've already checked them out. It's not COVID. And we have a doctor's note stating, you know, it's just seasonal allergies, no illness, what have you. To my understanding of what Barbara was saying, regardless of that note, they still need to quarantine for 24 hours so that your team has a chance to review the note before they can come back. Yeah, and I think more so than that, Amanda, it's just that most doctors won't say for sure it's not COVID. Uh, runny nose, rash, headache are all signs right now of the Delta COVID. And so it, that's what's so hard to know. So the note actually has to say, it is not COVID. And so if the note says that, we will take that note. If not, we just need a PCR test. Um, again, they're free at places like the health department and Walgreens, et cetera. Um, but um, it, it would need to say non-COVID or you would need a PCR test. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure that uh, yeah. that was understanding because I know like, I was obviously really sick earlier this year and it wasn't COVID, but you know, they still treated it like COVID. So I kind of wanted to make sure about that. Yeah. Aspect and that's it. a good point too. And there are people that are getting negative COVID tests that are positive. I know no one wants to hear that, <laughs> but sometimes it takes two or three tests to show that they're positive. So um, it's just going to be part of the fun of the year. And hey, we I'm gonna, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, and so in the event, it becomes a case like what with Austin and Greater Clark County Schools, things like that, and you do have to, you know, go. we do have to go off campus. Um, how far ahead would we receive that notification about the campus being closed? I know you guys try to do your best, but. Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, I, I think Austin made that communication and they were closed the next day because it was that severe of a situation. Um, you know, I, I feel like we've got our handle on things. I mean, we've had studios that have had five or six kids out with symptoms. Um, and so far, like I said, we've only had one positive. We do have families still waiting, a lot of families still waiting on PCR tests. 
Um, so, you know, we're, our goal is not to surprise anybody. Um, I intend to have more of these updates, you know, regularly so people kind of know what's going on and what you're seeing. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish I could tell you that we'll let everyone know so many days ahead. I have no idea what's going to happen, but we will do our best to give you as much lead time as we can. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Okay. The couple of people who raised their hands, hang on, I've got you in the queue, but I'm going to go to a couple of questions on the chat that were in there. Um, so if a learner has recently had COVID in July and are later identified as a close contact, will they need to quarantine? I'll answer that, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, per our plan, we are not making a distinction of if you've recently had COVID or not. So we're going to treat you based on your vaccinated, unvaccinated status for a close contact um, versus making a difference for if you've had it recently. Barbara, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and the reason for that is, I mean, the CDC does say 90 days, three months. We can't keep track of all that. <laughs> we, we can't be a school and try to keep track of all that. So we're just using the vaccinated or unvaccinated component of that. Um, somebody just gave an FYI that Norton Immediate Care Centers are offering rapid PCR tests, but you need to verify that they'll test asymptomatic people. So that is another thing as you dig into the test. There's so many layers, but as long as when you get the test, if you're able to get the test, it says PCR, we will accept it if it's a PCR test. I think that's the important thing to remember. Um, and then some of the nuances. And I'm curious, working. Erica, if you could tell us if they had to pay their urgent care copay or immediate center, immediate care copay for that test. Um, I don't believe so. I actually okay. looked it up for my mom today. Okay. So she's going today so I can ask her and, and let you know as soon as she comes back, but I do not think so. And that's the one in Clarksville up behind Target. Um, it's actually, I called multiple locations. The one okay. in Clarksville does, um, I believe does do it for asymptomatic individuals. Um, but again, I would call ahead because there's locations all over the area that will okay. and will not. Yeah. But, and also might be changing, right? <laughs> So, thank you. Um, Kia, um, if it has an alternate diagnosis, it gets squirrely. So, we just emphasize that it says non-COVID, you're safest with that and or a negative PCR test. We have had some notes that, have, that we've accepted that have had an alternate diagnosis, but it just has to be um, really clear. It's a rarity, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, sometimes it's because they've diagnosed, a, a, you know, a young, like, one-year-old with an ear infection, and they had a fever, and that's the only other symptom they had, and they had, you know, um, they're, they're, they were uh, mal, they were teething, so anyway, uh, it's a rarity that we accept that, but we'd rather you just get the PCR. Yeah. Um, going to the people who have raised hands, and then we'll come back to the chat, so I think, Kate, you were first, if you want to go ahead. Hey guys, it's Alex Fox. Hey guys. Uh, just hey, just wanted to get clarification with the doctor's notes. Um, say that it actually says on the doctor's note, COVID testing negative. Mm -hmm. um, the request to still have the actual test sent in is that just to make sure that it's a PCR test? You got it. Yep. Okay. Just wanted yep. to clarify on that. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. And Emily, you're next. Yeah, um, can I ask a question about the absence waivers? Yes. Okay, so my kid is out right now, and I tried to fill out an absence waiver, and it asked for a document. It required a document in order for it to be filled out. Um, is that supposed to be a document showing that my kid is sick or showing that he's working on his schoolwork? Like, yeah. I'm real clear on what I'm asking for. Emily, it can be a picture of the work your, your learner did at home or any kind of other suggestions that the teacher recommended for him to do at home. So it can be different things. It can be a picture, it can be a PDF, um, you know, a Word document, or whatever you feel like the best way to share it out. It could be a picture of you and your child smiling if you wrote all the details in the um, absence waiver. So it's just a way we're just trying to make sure that families upload what they need. It could just be a piece of paper that says they've uploaded everything on the Google Classroom. So um, what, whatever it needs to be to help help you to know. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, back to the chat. Um, Julia asks, 
clarifying about the break outside from mask, are masks off out all the time outside now? And the answer to that is no, but Barbara, I'll let you if you wanna address that. Yeah, so we asked that um, learners are six feet apart when they're outside. Um, and so if they're closer than that, like if they're sitting next to someone talking, then we ask them to have their masks on outside. Otherwise, they are mask free um, when they're outside. Go ahead, Julia. Uh, the reason I posted that was just that um, every day last week when I picked up from early ed extended, my daughter didn't have her mask on at all. Um, I have like at, at any point. And she was close to other kids. Um, <clears throat> I didn't see any staff members were, you know, reminding her to put her mask on. So that was a bit concerning. Okay. That was every single day that I picked her up. Okay. Yeah, I'll, we'll check in. I mean, I know that, you know, if they have a brief encounter, we're not having them put their mask on, but if they're gonna be sitting down with someone for like several minutes, I mean, the, the, the CDC guidance is 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. So um, we're trying to think of it that way. Like if they're having a brief encounter, we're not having them put their mask on, but we will remind all of us um, about that rule to make sure that they are keeping that distance. Thank you for letting us know. There are just some comments about um, tests and costs um, in there and some people had to pay a copay. Um, some people didn't. Uh, what criteria will you use to determine if we go back to hybrid or off campus learning? You know, it's going to be about staff. That's the only criteria, really. Um, we have to be able to have teachers here. Um, and uh, so, you know, if we have to quarantine or host studio and we have five staff members that have children in that studio um, and they have to go and care for their kiddos, like those are all the things that come into play. Um, so our goal is, you know, um, to keep people in the building and be able to keep that going. But if you have several teachers in the same studio that have to be out with their children and that's happening throughout the building, um, that's when that all gets tricky. So. Um, the subs, of course, are going to help with that. If there's just one teacher out or if two teachers are out in one studio, we'll move somebody over. But if we're moving everybody and everyone's just trying to be in the building, at some point that becomes counter supportive of the mission. So, um, you know, those are the things that the reasons we would go off campus for a period of time or a, a, a whole level or studios off campus. Um wanting an update on the mask breaks for eating lunch and what's happening with that. Um, so the all the studios, yeah, are still doing um, two um, sessions of lunch so that kids can stay six feet apart or as close to as that as possible, which is in our plan. So we're still doing that piece. Um, and, um, you know, other than that, um, you know, it, it's the only way for us to stay on campus is to do that. And it's just the very best that we can do, um, which is that, you know, to try to get to that six feet part when they're unmasked and eating. And then we, we remind them to, as soon as they're finished eating, they put their mask back on or they get up and move around the room or anything like that. A question about if we go off campus completely again, will the family support program be reestablished and will people be able to sign up in half? I mean, I think the short answer to that is probably. Um, the long answer to that is uh, our goal is to keep the building open for everybody all year. So with that goal in mind, you know, we, we, there may be a period of time where people that need the support the most won't have it to get to the long-term goal of keeping the building open. Um, now, there may, be, may come a time and no one knows, you know, and no one hopes that it happens, but that the health department asks all schools to close for a period of time. Let's say they say to close in, in, from no, November break to, you know, February. Then, of course, we would put the FSP program in place so we could help those families. Um, but, uh, you know, our goal is to try to keep um, everyone in the building all year. I know I'm sound like a, a broken record, aren't I? Sorry, but that's our intention. We have a question about in-school isolation and Jamie, I'll take a stab, but I think you're meaning, would we isolate someone from their class if they had symptoms? But 
I think from a learner's perspective, they're going to be sent into a, it is a certain area of the cupola area, but it's still similar to the process of normal sickness if you had that at any other time, any other year. So I don't think any special conversation needs to happen. If I'm not answering your question, feel free to unmute and tell me if I did or not. My, thank you, Melissa. My question is more so, um, I anticipate that if, uh, for example, our nine-year-old learner gets her, you know, allergy cough in September and she is removed from her studio and isolated to be picked up, um, she will panic and that will be very stressful. And so I'm curious if there are conversations happening in the studio around if this happens, this is what we'll do, then you'll, you know, kind of an action step plan or if we need to be preparing them for that possibility. Like, I don't want to overstep the information from our perspective. Right. And I think that if anyone has a specific concern for a learner, there's some other things we could do besides bringing them up here. Um, you know, so like, for example, they could go sit on their patio while they're waiting for them to go home. So feel free to have those specific conversations with your teachers. Um, we aren't really talking to the kids about it because we don't want them to look at that specific place that we're putting them and think, oh, those are the kids that have COVID or anything like that. So, you know, we're trying not to make a big deal about it. And we do it as nonchalant as possible and you know um, uh, they are you know if they're get a, given a test here at school the person is suited up that could be a little bit um, you know weird for a young person and so we try to warn them about that someone's gonna come in they're gonna have a little you know yellow suit on it's no big deal they're gonna have a mask on that kind of thing but otherwise you know we try to just make it real matter of fact no big deal um, as well thanks for asking Jamie A question of is it for the teens and outside time as well for being able to unmask so a teen was evidently told they could not take their mask off outside for sure i don't know all the scenarios some studios have done group outside for example and so they've kept masks because they're all sitting next to each other outside um so i would just ask the teacher that what what, what are what are the parameters? When do they unmask? Those kinds of things. Um, other times they've been in like uh, partnerships and doing things like scavenger hunt and sometimes they've been wearing masks for that I've seen. So um, generally speaking, if they're outside just doing some outside time, expiration, downtime, that kind of thing, um, they've been unmasked. Is there any talk of allowing the woods to do flex time prior to October break? And also in the woods, if kids have to quarantine, our teachers, vid teachers videoing lessons to help keep up with the lessons. To be out of school for two weeks would be a lot of misinformation. Yeah, most of the Google Classrooms for, I mean, most of those like seminars in the woods haven't, or they're, they're just beginning this week. Um, and the plan is to videotape those just because we found that's a really good practice, whether it's COVID or not. Um, so when they can, they are. And, um, and as far as flex time, you know, you could, and that would be more of a question if you want to look at an exception for that prior to October break. Um, most of the time they're doing a lot of still studio activities and they're doing um, introductory lessons and so forth because there won't be any synchronous learning happening. Um, with off-campus learners at this point. Um, that's why they really want to wait until that after October break part. All right, Holly, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, make sure that um, we're still doing like the single ply masks. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm at work. I'm trying to be as sure, you're so fine. We can hear you perfectly. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure because I know um, Joshua was kind of panicking. He's like, Mom, he's like, I, I need another mask. He's like, and this one we sewed together because we needed two. I was like, well, I'll just I'll just take the sewing out. But he kind of panicked. So he came home. Uh, what was it on Friday with a different mask? I'm like, oh, I like that one. Um, but it happened to be something he won, so I, I thought it was kind of cool. But I just wanted to make sure that we were still doing one plies because I have a couple of them on order that fit him because he's got such small ears. Yeah, so, you know, um, the CDC still recommends multiple layers in masks. Like this KN95 mask that I'm wearing is, I think, four layers. 
can't tell that it's four layers. Um, the, the cloth masks that most of the staff wear is usually two to three layers. Multi-layered masks are still the best thing to do. Um, we removed that part at, uh, in our COVID plan just because of all of the community's concern about masking. Um, that's why we, we took, it, took it out of there, but we still recommend multi-layer masks. Um, we have had learners bring uh, masks that are not multi-layered and they fall down and we'll give them something different to wear. <laughs> so does that help, Holly? Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Of course. I don't see any other questions or hands right now unless people want to add something in the chat. I do want to take a minute if people are thinking about if there's anything else you want to ask. Um, that uh, tomorrow is our new family orientation and that can also be for families that have been here for a while and you just want to come and it'll probably be a smaller group than this um, and so we'll just you know talk about you know how the school works how the school is working right now you'll get to meet some of the people it's all virtual um, but that is tomorrow at five o'clock and so if you have an RSVP for that can you drop that in Prana or Melissa if they want to RSVP from this list um, for that meeting uh, we encourage you to come. It's really an adult conversation, although it's virtual. Obviously, you can have your kiddos around, um, but it, it really is more of that adult conversation to know who to go to for this or how to find out about that, that kind of thing. So um, go ahead, Nicole. Sorry, I had to muted if you're talking. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I figured it out. Um, yeah. If you do decide that children need to stay home or something like that. Um, we returned our computers. I know you touched on this earlier, um, but when would we get those? Would we have to go back a separate time? Like, or like, when would we be able to pick those up? Yeah, so, I, it would, I guess it would be nice to have them in advance. Just of in course. Case, but. I wish we had enough for everyone to have one at home and here. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't. But yeah. um, like we had a young person, a teen actually go home today that said they needed a, a computer and we sent her home with a computer. So, um, you know, uh, you can always okay. let us know that when we call you, um, oh, you know, to tell you to come pick it up. So just say, we really need a, a Chromebook and we'll send you home with one. Okay. That's yeah. good thinking. My brain yeah, isn't working. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amanda, I think you were next. Amanda, you might be muted if you're talking. I was, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I just had a question slash comment about the car rider one and didn't know if I can mention that here or Absolutely, go for it, okay. yep. So this is my first year <laughs> and um, one of the things I noticed was that, you know, it looks like it appears to me that, you know, whenever we're coming to pick up and drop off the kids, we're going by like the name, the face, like, oh, okay, I've seen this person before, or, you know, I can tell this person, oh, I'm picking up these kids. And especially because I'm brand new to the school and nobody's ever really like doesn't know me per se, you know, kind of trusting my word, like, oh, yeah, I'm here to pick up these kids and whatnot. And so I was wondering if or hoping that maybe I can make the suggestion of maybe like having like a number hanging number system where it has the name of the school, your kid has a number and then the teachers too. Like if you have subs who are helping with the car ride or whatnot, they can look at the sheet and the number and say, okay, van two is picking up these kiddos and then so on and so forth. And then too, like if you have people who need to pick up um, kids that aren't necessarily on the list, they have that hanger because, you know, mm -hmm. teachers get busy and Donnie went with emails, the front desk does as well, and so on and so forth. So I just kind of oh. wanted to make that. Yeah, I appreciate that, the suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alima, I think you were next. Hopefully I said your name correctly. Yeah, you got it. Um, I don't know if you answer this or not because I just got in mid-conversation. Uh, but I wanted to ask, uh, what are you guys doing cleaning wise, like um, for COVID? Um, is it like a everyday thing after the kids leave or is it weekly? 
Yeah, those are really good questions. There is an everyday multi-day uh, practice that's used in every studio. Um, and so there's things like after lunch, before lunch, there's different times they do different pieces. Now they do because they're using materials all day. We do not sanitize all the materials all day. We focus on hand washing and sanitizing their own hands. And then they do cleaning of the frequently used materials um, uh, frequently. And, um, and if we've had, you know, um, uh, a, a positive case or, you know, several kids we had a quarantine, the studio might say, go ahead and spray. We have a sprayer that's used after the kids leave that dries throughout the night. Um, so we have that process. We also have um, clean air system. Um, I don't know what those are called. Kelly, if you remember the names of those, like in the, in the locations and the isolation areas, we have these clean air units that, that move the, the air around. Um, and then we have, you know, we've talked about before just the ventilation system. We've got it at full capacity and we have the, vent, uh, the, the, the energy recovery units that rotate the air in the building. Gosh, I can't remember the number of this, Melissa, if you remember six times a day, six times an hour. It's four times an hour, Barb. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, four times an hour. So it rotates all the air in the building, um, you know, four times an hour, which is also really helpful. And we're keeping the units on um, extended periods of time too right now. I hope that helped. Yes. Can I, can I add to that too? Yeah. Uh, also, uh, our environmental staff comes in and they are they have a, a cleaning uh, container that they are wiping down anything that can be touched, hand doorknobs, handles, light fixtures, all that throughout the day. And then when they come in at night uh, to actually clean the studios, they're actually hitting those items again. So that's mm -hmm. a multi-step when actually what we know learners are touching on a regular basis uh, through the, the physical components. Okay, Jessica. Just trying to get myself out of mute was a challenge. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, sorry, I was not uh, clear about the doctor's note. Uh, the doctor's note if I, when is a PCR test required. So mm -hmm. let's say my daughter, she usually has ear infections and in, uh, we know it's like allergy, caused by allergies. Mm -hmm. So she, easy, take her to the doctor, check their ears, she gets amoxicillin. Does, so in that case, do I need a PCR test? Because she will get, so do I need a PCR test for something like that where the doctor can say this is an ear mm -hmm. infection or yeah, and so, you know, two things to do. Um, one is to talk to the doctor ahead of time or while you're at the doctor, say, my school usually requires either a note that says non-COVID or a PCR test. And if they're like, well, I don't feel comfortable writing the non-COVID, but I'll give her a PCR test. Or they'd be like, I don't feel comfortable writing the non-COVID and I wouldn't give her a PCR test for this. Um, then give it back to us. I mean, we do make exceptions. Like I said, they're rare. But ear infection is, is the most common exception that we make, especially for those little, you know, like one to four year olds um, where it can be pretty frequent. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I got a, a good idea. I appreciate All right, it. Great. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Someone made a comment that if they were to sub, they would need child care for their one year old. Would it be possible to accommodate her in the nursery for the day? Yeah, so the nursery is full with like 15 people on the wait list. Unfortunately, it's not a drop off surface, but, um, you know, sometimes people make friends with others. And um, so we encourage you to reach out to other family members in your child's studio or from the directory um, and see if there's any connections like that. Um, there was just some side discussion happening about the COVID group and team and what we meant. So just to clarify that verbally too, Barbara, so you can add if you want to. I just said, teachers are the first line of communication always, and they, you will hear from your teachers. The COVID team, which basically means the cupola staff, mm -hmm. are kind of their backup for making decisions, tracking siblings, PCR tests. Um, so when we talk about the COVID team, sometimes the teachers need help with evaluating things, and we're here to help them do that. That's exactly right, yeah. Thank you. Holly, you had your hand up. Um, I know this is kind of, this is not COVID related, um, but uh, 
Barbara just brought up um, about, you know, making friends and stuff like that. I know there's a lot of us that um, run businesses and we have, I know the school has a list of like um, sponsors and things like that. Um, and I, I, how can I get a copy of that list? Like the carpool list? Um, no, the, the list, um, I know when I first signed the boys up, um, you could register your business, you know, donate. Oh, okay. Like yeah. Melissa can help you with that. Dollars. Yep. Yeah. Cause I, I really, really would like to, you know, use Great. like family people versus Great. strange people. Melissa, so, you want to chat about that? Great. Thanks, Holly. Melissa, you're on mute if you're speaking. Sorry. Well, actually, you hit on one big thing that um, I'm very behind on, thanks to <laughs> other responsibilities. Um, last year's group is still up there, and it is on the website, and many of those are repeats for this year, but that, unfortunately, is missing a few people who added themselves this year, so hopefully that will get done um, here soon, but it is active. You can go to our website, current families, and then family business directory, and they're listed there. And you, you, can you just drop your email in there so she can email you, Holly can email you about her business? Oh, sure. Yeah, great. Thanks. Alex, did you have something else? Yeah, Barb. Um, just wanted to go back over the question that I asked before because some recent answers kind of um, went the other direction. So the question I asked before was about if the doctor's note states that if the COVID test was negative, um, do you still need to provide the test as well, the test results? Because yes. from Okay, because from some of the discussions that I've been listening to, um, the term, you know, you need a doctor's note or the test results, but it seems like you absolutely need both. Well, if the doctor's nose says it's non-COVID, we don't need both. Well, that's the what I'm trying to specify. Like the uh, doctor's notes I turned in last week, all three of them said COVID tests are negative. Yes. And so we just, right. So we um, just asked for the test actually. So it was a piece, so we could verify it was a PCR test. Okay. So then it either needs to, the, the doctor's note, we need to get them to specify that a PCR test was administered and negative, or we need the doctor's note and the PCR test. So sometimes, Alex, the doctor's note just says it's non-COVID. There was no PCR test even done. Okay. Like this one says COVID testing was negative. So right. does it need to specify PCR? Most of the time, we'll just ask the families to send us the PCR test. You know, that's the easier thing to do than to have the doctors put the specific wording in there. What we found, in most cases, families just send us because they can get it from their portal, the PCR test. And that's, yeah. I understand, I just wanted to get that specified because, you know, there's people trying to get multiple tests done. You know, they're thinking, oh, if I just get the doctors, no, it'll be fine. But in this case, it seems that you know, it'd be easier if we just specify, yeah, you're most likely going to need the test and the um, doctor's note. Yeah, we will just take the PCR test without the doctor's note. If you just send us the actual test, then that nullifies the doctor. So that's, we just need to see the test. Shouldn't need to see a doctor saying the test was negative. If a test was done, we would just need the actual test. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Because we keep saying you need either the doctor's note or the test. Right. You need to confirm it's a PCR test. Then it seems really what we're needing is the PCR test results. Yep. Okay. You got it. Okay. Just wanted to verify that because I know there's going to be parents that are going to be like, okay, well, if you can just go ahead and give me the doctor's note and they don't have the test results, you know, at hand and they don't have the light chart portal because it takes over an hour to 24 hours, depending on your place for them to set up my chart. Gotcha. So it yeah. can cause even more of a delay. I'm just trying to get this yeah. handed so we have the most efficient method, you know, laid out for, right. uh, yeah. 
And, and then as soon as you get this all down, we're going to tell you we've got another option for you, and it's we're going to start all over in our learning curve again, right? Gotcha. But hopefully it will help families to do this quicker and better. We don't really want to be a PCR drop-off site, but we know it will help our families, you know, to get this done quicker. So we're working our best to try and make that happen. Oh, great. I just wanted to get clarification yeah. on that. So I wasn't Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Anything we have some else? side conversation going on about volunteering in the building, and I basically just said right now the only volunteers in the building will be subs just as the most essential need. Um, but there are things that you can do from home to support if you want to, and there'll probably actually be some information coming from PIP about that soon. Um, and then Miranda is asking who is doing the subbing. Yeah, so we, we've had, you know, what we call kind of our super subs that we've started to contact a few of them already. Some of you are on the call and I'm looking at you right now. Look, they're smiling um, because, you know, we'll be calling you soon saying, are you going to be able to help us again? So, um, you know, as, as we, you know, we want to get to the families that have done this before um, and we're that we'll start with until we do the sub workshop on September 7th. I think we've got it again. I don't see any outstanding questions. All right, we'll stick on for a minute if you have anything else. We really appreciate your time. We hope this was helpful. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for being a part of our school family. See you later. <laughs>